Hi, welcome to another episode of Special Times with Pierre Filosa and my guest, Mr. Kevin Calcite. Thank you very much for having me, Peter. You're welcome. Um, Kevin is running against Republican Marcus Vaughn to replace Republican Sean Dooley, who served the seat from 2014 to 2022. Kevin was elected to Norfolk's planning board in 2017 and to Norfolk's select board in 2018. He was elected chair of the select board in 2019. He was reelected to the select board in, 20, in 2021. Um, welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute honor to be on the show. After we met at Medfield Day a few weeks back, I was really excited to hear about the interest in doing the show. And as you read through all those elections, my lord, I just realized I've been through a lot of elections already. What inspired you to run for, for state representative? Well, there's a couple of things, honestly. You know, the first, I would say, started when I was living in Chicago, working in hotels. I had the wow. opportunity to work at the Hilton Chicago on Michigan Avenue on the night that Barack Obama won his election. Wow. So I got to be there and be in the midst of all of that craziness, that togetherness, that happiness, that joy. And it just overtook me to see that be a part of the political spectrum. I think that's where it started. Seeing that was inspiring to me. So then I decided when I moved here to Norfolk, I ran for the planning board because I wanted to help people understand some of our goals associated to long-term housing development. After I did that, I joined the select board. And I realized, hey, there's an opportunity here to improve transparency and engagement, and we did that. And you know, now I see this state rep seat and I say, wow, there is an opportunity to take all those things that we've done locally and bring them into Beacon Hill and in part of the state representation. So I'm super excited to bring all those things forward, and I really feel that a lot of people are as well. What do you consider your top accomplishments in Norfolk, and how will, you, how will that success translate to state government? Sure. So as I mentioned, I ran for the planning board to assist with helping others in the community to understand our goals from a housing perspective. So engagement was a big thing that I pushed for, both in the planning board and on the select board. To be able to do that, I did a cable show much like yours to be able to work with the town administrator to let people know in town what's going on. I instituted office hours, so if people had a question, they didn't have to come to the form of a select board meeting to ask it, we could do it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then further than that, we worked on transparency and being able to ensure that all of our information was out there for people to read. Uh, we understood that social media was a big medium to communicate, so we actually put in social media policies for all the departments in town so they could begin to leverage that and be able to connect with individuals as well. And finally, I would say zoning. We talked about housing a lot in Norfolk and needing a plan in place. And we went through a two and a half year process to be able to adjust zoning for town center where it was most appropriate to allow for denser uh, development. Um, mixed use, commercial on the first floor, some housing on the top right next to our transit station. It's exactly what we need to do to most appropriately and proactively plan for growth. So I think that by being able to take some of those successes and be able to bring them to Beacon Hill to see if they have statewide applicability, I just feel like there's a lot of opportunity there. So transparency, housing, and collaboration are three things that I would love to pull from the success locally over into Beacon Hill. So talk about housing. We, we both need to work on that um, together because I'm right now, I'm, I'm living at a group home all the way in Roslindale in, in Boston and I hope someday to live closer to my hometown, Midfield, and I would love for us to work together and try to figure out how we can get more housing for people with special needs and disabilities because that's important to me. Absolutely, and I do believe that there is a partnership there between the select boards in each of the towns around here. All six towns in this district are experiencing issues and opportunities associated to housing development. So I think by working collaboratively all together and understanding the needs of each specific community, we'll be able to get there. If you're elected as state representative, what would be your main priorities and how are they important to the 9th Norfolk District? 
So primarily, I think one of the big things I wanted to focus on when we first announced that we were going to run was local support. Being a select board member myself, I understand some of the challenges that our communities are facing today. So being able to address unfunded mandates, uh, housing planning, things of those nature was going to be one of the biggest priorities that we had. But as we've gone around, we've understood kind of the pain points for individuals within the district. And we made them part of our platform and our priorities. Things like education funding, child care. The crazy cost of child care right now is the second highest in the country. So we need to find ways to be able to assist with that cost for people who live in the district. Mental health and substance abuse has been a big priority for us. I'm married to a pediatric neuropsychologist and we understand a lot of the troubles that individuals have had over the course of the last three years and how the long-term impacts of that are still not understood. Um, so being able to push for more resources and access to care are going to be important for us. Infrastructure, engaging with all of the planners from the six towns to understand what the limitations are and the barriers to be able to grow for each town is, you know, having water availability, road conditions, uh, things of that nature are going to be a big priority for us. And then finally, sustainability, being able to hit our goals and be able to plan for the future and address the negative implications of climate change. These are all going to be very important for us and things we're going to push for on day one. What do you think are the biggest problems in Massachusetts government that need to be fixed? Well, I hate to keep saying the word housing over and over again, but you know, housing is going to be a big theme. We are in a housing crisis right now. The cost of housing is astronomical. Um, and it's not any better when you go to rental properties either. So we need to be able to address the core impact there, and that's going to be stock and increasing stock. I've, ad I've identified that there is a way that we can modernize our housing approach, away from things like 40B that incentivize us just to go with the biggest and most you know, dense project you can, and instead focus on what planners call the missing middle, putting in duplexes, triplexes, mixed-use development in town centers that work best to fit the municipality that they're going into. I think that's going to be a key for us to be able to actually make some tangible progress in terms of housing development. The second one is transit. Obviously, it's no secret that the MBTA is having its struggles right now. Yeah, it's not, not good. No, no, it is not good. But, you know, in speaking with individuals who work at the state level, I understand that there needs to be more of a balance in the way that expenses are allocated for operational needs and capital needs, whereas I think that's been kind of out of whack for the last couple of years. So between a management effort and between the audits that are being done with the assistance of the federal level, I think that there's going to be an avenue there. It just needs to be managed appropriately. In, um, in 2019, I went to a Thanksgiving dinner uh, event for Vincent with my group home from Roslindale, and I got to meet um, the governor, Charlie Baker. Very got nice. to meet him, got my photo taken with him. And I got to meet Ed Markey. They're both really p nice people. Absolutely. And Ed Markey actually just endorsed our campaign as well. He was cool. very nice. I got the, my photo taken with him, which was awesome. <laughs> as a special needs adult, the Department of De Developmental Services, DDS, and the agencies DDS supports have been an important part of my life, for example, I was in a day program at HMEA in Plainville in 2014 to 2015. They gave me training and job support when I worked at Shaw's in Midfield. As a state rep, how would you support the special needs adults and services pro providers in our district? Well, I will say primarily, you know, working locally, we spend a lot of time advocating for and providing our schools with the needs that they need to be able to service those who have special needs. So whether it be being able to bridge budgetary gaps or being able to approve certain funding sources, you know, we've always been a supporter uh, of those types of expenses locally. Looking ahead, you know, I would love to be able to advocate for more Chapter 70 funding and for fully funding the special needs circuit breaker for education to be able to ensure that we continue to uh, fund those programs. Um, I also want to note the fact that, you know, last summer, Governor Baker, as you had mentioned before, did sign legislation into law that um, allowed for individuals who had intellectual, intellectual disorders to be able to come into a public university, a state university or college to be able to work towards a higher education degree. I would love to be able to build on top of that to open up more opportunities and more options for individuals coming up to be able to go to trade schools, vocational schools, and not just have it be centered around public state universities. Lately, some of my staff from my group home have been leaving because they're not, um, they're not getting paid well enough by, by Vinf 
by my group home agency. I don't want to name names, but right. um, I would like to s see that change in the very near future for them to get paid better for my house staff. Absolutely. And the staff at my agency, that I would like to see them get paid better so they can stay around for long, longer periods of time. It all centers around funding. You're absolutely right. Um, is internships plus opportunities at the state house? Absolutely. There are a number of internship, pro in internship programs that are available at the state house. Um, obviously, this is the first time I'm running for that type of role, so I look forward to hearing more about those along with you and uh, pass them along as soon as I learn more. All through the, s the state legislature in Massachusetts is strongly dominated by Democrats. We have often had Republican governors. Do you have any examples of how you have worked in a bipartisan way? Absolutely. So, you know, the first thing is when you're working locally on a select board or a planning board, uh, partisan association doesn't exist. We, we intentionally keep that off of those ballots because we know that the clearest path to be able to institute actual change and policy alignment is to leave that out of it. So we don't necessarily locally have the ability to fall back on the fact that there's a majority party or there's some overlying theme that's keeping us from getting things done. You're just expected to get things done. So by taking that kind of mentality and bringing it into the state house, I look forward to getting around partisan affiliations and trying to fit people into their individual buckets and instead focus on the individual, their character, their principles, the things that drive them as an individual and focus on making those connections to be able to get actionable change. So, you know, from my perspective, I look at platform, I look at priorities, I look at a record of what people have actually done. And that's what I use to be able to bridge those gaps. So when you talk about local progress, when we went through our zoning effort, there was a lot of interactions where you work working with somebody who had an oppositional point of view, who didn't agree with the direction or had a big problem with what you were pitching. The key is to sit down with them, to talk with them, understand more about their perspective instead of just shutting them down as somebody who doesn't agree and then using that to be able to build a direction that everybody can get on board with. That's the way that I will take bipartisanship into the State House. Do you have any favorite people already in the State House and local government, either Democrat or Republican? Yeah, well, I do have a number of favorite people. Over the course of the last few weeks, I've had the opportunity to connect with a number of individuals, whether it be through our uh, roundtable discussions focused on policy. We did one on mental health and substance use. We did another one on infrastructure. And in all of these, I've had individuals like Jeff Roy from Franklin come in to share his experience from a mental health and substance use perspective. We had Congressman Jake Auchincloss come to our infrastructure discussion to talk about some of the federal programs that are there to support us. But I will say one of the most favorite people that I've spoken to over the course of the last few weeks has been your friend, Denise Garlick. She was an incredible resource to help me understand more about her time in the State House as well as her time serving the people of half of Medfield. Um, and I believe that I'm really excited to share that she'll be endorsing our campaign uh, later on this evening. And I would like to say to, to Denise, if you're watching, I hope you, I hope you get well soon That's right. from your, your knee replacement. Knee I, hope, surgery. Yep. I hope you get well soon and, and I hope everything goes well with you, Denise. We all care about you. and as a person and as a state rep, and I hope you get well soon and take care of yourself. Absolutely. An important, ish, an important issue is reproductive rights. Where do, you, where do you draw the line? Well, we know that in 2020, there was the passage of the Roe Act, right, that codified abortion rights here in Massachusetts. So we were protected from the Supreme Court's decision. Um, you know, I still think that there is an opportunity here in Massachusetts for us to be able to address high costs, uh, restrictions uh, associated to insurance coverage or under-resourced providers here in the state. Um, so I look forward to pressing for those types of initiatives to ensure that everybody has equitable access to reproductive health care. Um, and I'll also note that I have been endorsed by both Planned Parenthood and by Reproductive Equity Now and look forward to partnering with them on initiatives once I get into the seat. The economy and inflation are also important issues. How do you think you can work with the state government to improve the economy and reduce 
the effects of inflation on your constituents? Yeah, so obviously this is top of mind for everybody right now, right? The cost of everything is through the roof and affordability has been a common theme we've heard as we've gone around through the campaign trail and talked to individuals here in the district. Um, in terms of prioritizing certain initiatives, the first thing I would want to work on is the economic development bill that didn't make it out of the last session. You know, that bill included a lot of options such as tax relief, uh, critical funding for housing and for health care. Um, there was a lot of things in there that I think would be able to assist with some of the pain people are feeling right now. So I would want to prioritize putting my support behind that bill and getting that over the finish line. Additionally, we know that there are funds coming back to everybody thanks to 62F, um, the program from the 1980s that identified if there was a surplus in tax revenue and needed to go back to the taxpayers in the state. Um, so obviously very much look forward to that being executed, which I believe is targeted for sometime in November. Um, so that will also assist. Um, and then I, I talked before about child care. Child care is an incredible, incredibly high cost here in the Commonwealth, um, disproportionate to the rest of the country. So I would love to support bills like H4795, which is an act to expand access to high quality and affordable early education and child care to assist families with the exorbitant cost. Um, my dentist and her office are, strong, are strongly in favor of question two. What do you think about the proposed restrictions on dental insurers? So I will say this, you know, with all of these ballot questions, you have to look at the pros and cons associated to them. And you know, in doing that, I've identified that there is a distinct benefit in you know, ensuring that these uh, insurance companies do have to rebate back anything over a certain threshold, I believe it's 83% back to um, payees. Um, and I also understand what's being proposed as the con to that, that there is the potential that premiums could rise to be able to accommodate for that offset. But in going through and identifying the billions of dollars that would be owed back to payees at this point and not really understanding where a lot of that perceived increase could come from on the back end, I'm in support of it as well. And I will be voting yes on question two. What do you feel about question one and the taxation in general? Well, coming from state government, I mean, it's from local governments, you know, taxation is our primary source of revenue. Um, so it's an essential function for us to be able to operate at the municipal level and provide programs, education, all these things that are so important to our day to day lives. That being said, you know, I do believe that question one, like with question two, has its pros and cons. You know, you, we have the ability to be able to take something that in working on local budgets for the last five years, we've identified state funding for things like education and roads and infrastructure and transportation has been keeping up with the rising costs. So now municipalities are the ones who are kind of left to bridge that gap. And with the razor thin budget that we already work with, it's not really conceivable for the, for the, near, future, for the near future. So from my perspective, anything that we can do to bolster those areas from a state funding perspective without having a huge negative impact on the majority of taxpayers in the state needs to be considered. And as of right now, I am a yes on question one as well. Do you have any concerns about election integrity in Massachusetts? Do you think anything should be changed or subject to increased scrutiny? You know, I worked very closely with our town clerk and other town clerks in the area over the course of the last few years, whether it be for the execution of local elections, whether it be for the complexity of uh, ex executing an election during a global pandemic. And you know, from my perspective, I have not seen evidence that w there is anything going wrong or anything that's going awry with the way that we manage our elections. Obviously, it needs to have a close eye and it's something that we need to scrutinize whenever it, it's warranted. But up until this point, I haven't seen evidence of that. And I have faith in our town clerks that they're doing what's best for the voters and what's best for the Commonwealth. So from my perspective, no, I don't have those concerns now. I understand and I believe it's everybody's right to be able to ask questions and to scrutinize where appropriate. But from my perspective, I have seen no evidence that would cause for concern. Um, uh, before we close, any final thoughts or comments? Well, I will say this. You know, going into this new arena has been quite eye-opening for me. You know, it's not the select board races anymore. There's a lot different perspectives. There's a big range of priorities and expectations for the individual coming into this role but it has been amazing to talk to people and get them on board with the idea that it does not need to be as segmented and as split and as partisan as it has been. 
either on the national scale or even in other local municipalities. Me and you should work together on that special needs adults don't have a chance like for jobs and whatnot. Yep. And, and like myself, I, I should be out there having a job and I don't, I would love to be out there working, but because of certain agency, I don't want to name names, they can't get me out there like with a job, they can't get me a job coach or anything like that to help me get employed and, and whatnot, so. It, it definitely is something that needs to be addressed because we cannot waste this incredible personality that you have uh, that could be used in so many different facets of business today. So I agree with you. It's definitely something we need to work on. Um, but you know, in addition to that, I also believe that there is a lot of good that can come out from having a localized approach be brought to the state house that kind of get things done regardless of the perspective kind of mentality. Um, it's really resonated with people, whether it's Republicans, Libertarians, Democrats, Green Party, Rainbow Party, they all adhere to this platform. This platform is not partisan. This is not torn out of the page book of some national party. These are the things that matter to people across the political spectrum in this district, and I really do look forward to fighting for all of them. And do you have any, any advice for, for people like myself about jobs and... Uh, no, not off the top of my head. I don't have uh, precise advice, but what I can do is start digging into it and start keeping in the loop on what I'm able to find out. We want to thank Kevin for appearing today on Special Times with Pierre Filosa. We also plan to interview Marcus Vaughn in the next several days. The election is coming up on November 8th. Early voting has already started. Please vote. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Peter.